everybody. So today we have a special treat for Veterans Day. I actually got to talk to quite a few veterans today and that was specifically about their needs for their documents and their data. I was working with a major US government office and we're talking about how to digitize the documents of veterans and how do you make that the most effective, specifically using microservices as an architecture, as well as vectorizing the digitized documents so that if something needs updated, it can be done quickly and efficiently. All right, so what is a microservice? Imagine a microservice is like a bunch of Legos and each Lego piece serves a purpose. In this case, a microservice is a Lego and that is a service, a tool, or some kind of process. And the reason that you want to break these up into individual modules or components is so that if you have to take a component out and replace it, or you have to take something out and do some kind of maintenance or error resolution on it, it's not going to break the whole system. And that is essentially what we're talking about from a document perspective as well. Instead of having to basically take the whole document down, the whole form down, the whole system down, whatever it is in a microservice kind of framework, you can compartmentalize, you can segment out individual pieces of a system. You can also compartmentalize and break out individual pieces of a document and your entire document corpus. And the reason that you want to do that is so that if you have to plug and play, move things around, change things, you can do that effectively so that if something is affecting only a certain section of a document or one document and not all of the documents on a particular system or person, in this case with the veterans, you only have to deal with a specific issue at hand. And the two main benefits here are time and effectiveness. So I'm not going to go through each one of these. You can see these here. I will also have the presentation in the descriptions below so you can go and check that out. So essentially you're saving time because you no longer have to go and mine for all of that information. When you get an update, you don't have to go and try to figure out where that update is, make sure all of the other documentation is updated because you've already segmented these things out and connected them together. On an individual document, you are saving time because you don't have to go through the whole document. You don't have to go through and completely reprocess that document just for a few changes. And effectiveness, this is talking about that scalability. Can you make a change that is propagated to the rest of your corpus or the rest of your systems? If somebody updates their address or somebody updates their insurance information, or if you're working in supply chain information, which is another very common use case for this, maybe you have to change out a certain uh, part of your fleet of vehicles. This is a way to find that change quickly, change only the things that need to be changed, take down things that only need to be taken down without disrupting the entire system. All right, so now let's go and find out how you do it. So to start this process, we are going to be looking at document markup. So we've talked about this in a few videos before. So document markup is essentially uh, using OCR, um, which is, you know, the lower level. It's just optical recognition of the characters on the screen. It doesn't do great with zoning. It doesn't do great with um, form-like data. Now, what does do well with that is standards like XML, and here you can see some standards for that are JATS, which is for scholar scholarly publication, and EPUB, which is used for books. JATS also has a version for books, but I far prefer EPUB. Um, the other thing is HTML works very well for this as well. The interesting thing is you can have a PDF, you can have um, some kind of web page on the surface that that is all the user is seeing. They don't see all of that markup. That's really behind the scenes. Just like RDF, when you are looking at your search results in Google, you don't know that Google has basically created a, a network of all of those web pages nor do you care. You just care that you got the right information. In this case, all we care about is making sure the user and the update that they need for their documentation is done effectively and making sure that it propagates to all of the data regarding their situation and themselves 
or in supply chain management area. If it's something that is affecting the entire fleet, that the entire fleet is being addressed, that's where this comes into play. Speaking of RDF, this is something that you can actually code up in RDF. This is very common. I'm going to link below. Uh, Tiger Graph has an example graph that you can go and look at for supply chain, which is pretty cool. The other thing is, you know, if you don't want to go full graph on this, you don't have to. But making sure that you have that key value pair, this document has this information. This document mentions this standard. This document, this ID is connected to these standards. That kind of connectivity needs to be there. Graph-like structures are very um, natural for that, but you don't have to use it for that. I'm just mentioning it here because it's kind of what I do. In this example, we are looking at what's called fixed vectoring. So if you still need to make sure that you print, you actually have print publications or somebody has to print off those documents if they are doing um, something where they cannot just have a digital copy, that's where you would want something that's a fixed vectoring. Uh, that essentially means that each placement of a word is fixed on the screen. So if something gets swapped out, it's almost like if you justified your paragraph in Word where all the words kind of fit into that, that block, that's essentially what this would be doing. You don't have to do that though. If you don't, you're not going to have the line notations that you see here. You would only have the vector number. These are just numbers. And there are quite a few different vectoring methods. Just keep in mind, over on the left of the screen, you're going to be seeing the coded version. Again, this is not completely accurate. This is just for demonstration, but this is using XML JATS like uh, framework, as well as inserting those tags for the vectors. Now you don't always need to insert the vectors into the document itself. Some people have a completely different document that essentially keeps track of the vector. So it's completely separate from the, the published work um, or the work that goes into your systems. Uh, so here you have to make sure, just like many things on this channel, have a unique identifier. So that's gonna be your key. So the key value pair here is this is the unique ID and then any of the vectors that we have are going to be connected to that UID. Now you can do further embeddings here. So you can see that I have P5, P1, P3. Those are priorities. And while you can give that to your users if they, if they understand well enough when they update something, if it's a high priority or not, chances are you don't wanna put that in their hands. You want this to be a business decision. If somebody changes their name, is that important to you? If they change their address, is that more important to you? Exactly the same importance to you, less importance? It's really for you to prioritize the request for updates as they come in. Regular ticketing systems, JIRA is very uh, common. They can handle things like this. So if you are using JIRA, this is something that you can add into your ticketing system if that is the way that you are going to be taking and accepting those updates or if this is more of a form or a regulatory kind of framework where you have a chain of custody, so to speak, on those changes and people have to verify or systems have to verify throughout, this can be put into that automated system where as a change is propagated through the system to get published, that vector, it travels with it so that you don't lose track of where it's going to be. Again, that helps you with time and less errors because you know exactly what needs to be changed. So let's say this regulation, this is actually a standard, a recommended pilot system. Maybe we need that to be changed to, instead of being a recommendation, this document is now a regulation. So we have to go through and for this standard, right? We have the UID, this exact standard, a regulation has been passed by, let's say the US government, that all of the standards in this family of standards have to be changed from recommendation to standard or regulation. That's easy enough to do because you know that you can go through and do a search or maybe you already have tracked where recommendation is noted or when something is called a regulation. Maybe you have the regulation number as you can see in the bottom part of this document. But this is basically all vectoring is. It's counting words. 
and trying to make sense of them so that when you do get a change, you can make that change effectively. Okay, so how do you vector, right? So vectors are just triangulation, right? You're just finding where this thing is, you know, on a grid of, of information. So there are different methods, there's frequency, and this, by the way, this, this table is from O'Reilly. I'm gonna link that below if you wanna check out the full article, it's very good. So here you'll see things like frequency, which you can see is like Bayesian models. You'll see one hot encoding, which is more of like a neural network kind of approach. TFIDF is general purpose. I think this is the best one to start with just because there are so many really easy Python scripts and other things that you don't have to figure out yourself. You just go copy, paste, and run it. I would suggest starting with that if you don't know how to do this yet. Um, and you can see here what some of those considerations are depending on what your use case is. So some more specific types here. So BERT is one that I'm a big fan of right now. This one is doing, it's during, it's more on the neural network side. Um, but it really does a great job at parsing out what's in um, sentences and zoning. Um, it's also very good for classification. If you're trying to take those zones and those sentences and classify or mine things out, I will have a whole video on Bert, Ernie, Big Bird, and Elmo. Yes, those are things in a different time. Uh, some others here that I have tried that I really would suggest trying out, they're really good. Word to vec, top to vec, dot to vec. Um, obviously they're all talking about vectors. These I'm not going over in detail in this video because there's just too much to go over, but I will be having separate videos talking about the pros, the cons, the use cases for some of these others later on. So what does a zone look like? So here's a magazine article. If you're working with personal information, as I said, this might be a um, family history section. It might be an address section. Here in regular publishing, you'll see that in a newspaper article or a magazine article, there are different zones and information on the page. The reason that you want to be able to zone this is you don't want a computer to think that it's all one big blob of information because that's going to make the vector analysis very difficult. So entity parsing, by the way, some of these examples I also went over in a different context for machine learning in digital asset management and library systems. I'm gonna link that up here if you wanna go check that out. But in this situation, we're talking about entity parsing so that if a specific model or a specific system or a specific standard uh, or a specific medication for uh, a personal information is mentioned that you can quickly find that. And not only can you find it in one document, you can go through all of your documents and find all of the examples of where John C. Smith is, uh, is mentioned because maybe you're trying to find more information out about him um, in his military unit. Maybe you are trying to find all of the people in a certain population that are taking Zoloft and also have heart trouble. These are kind of the kinds of things that a lot of medical professionals are looking at and making sure that your documents are also coded in a way that you can gather those kinds of insights and update and address when appropriate is really going to help. All right, and the very last thing that I'm going to go over is I did briefly mention that you could be making links between individual pieces of information, those vectors or those zones within one document, but you can also propagate this over your entire corpus, trying to fit this zone is the same as this zone in all of these different documents. Maybe it's a standardized field that you need to update, or it could be that one person has many documents and their address needs to change in those many documents. Those types of things, you really do have to have good data governance in place. Some people can take data governance to the extreme. You have to do what is right for your institution. Here, this is just a general workflow. So the benefits here is you are going to have a common vocabulary for people to understand what you're doing with the data and how it's maintained. Maintaining is really important and making sure everybody understands how it's maintained, including the actual patient and user. They wanna have confidence that you're treating their data well. Increased analytics. So I already talked about some trend analysis. 
if you can share that with the patient or you can share that with the person, maybe you're using Fitbit information to do something, that's always good because people are really curious about their data. And nowadays, people have a better awareness of their data and how they own that data. Uh, implementing and enforcing policies to prevent errors and security risks. So especially when it comes to compliance like HIPAA and those types of things, GDPR, um, that is a you know kind of right to forget, um, data ownership kind of thing. All of these are better facilitated when you understand what is in your document space. So vectorizing, having at the very least zones and then connecting it into a data governance tool will really help you track all of that down and be very confident that you are being compliant and you are being safe and you are being secure. Help ensure compliances and laws. Again, that kind of goes hand in hand with what I just said. And then creating links between personnel, assets, and entities. So this one's really more about that overall data architecture of microservices, where if you have one service that is dealing with named uh, entity recognition, maybe you have another service that's doing disambiguation, maybe you have another service that is dealing with um, geotags based on people's geographic locations. Maybe you have a whole nother system that's talking about drug interactions. All of those things can be working completely separate and they don't have to have heavy dependencies on each other. Again, this allows you that Lego piece where you can take something out, put it in, fix it, move it around when you need it. All of that also facilitates making sure that you have the right people using the right tools at the right time. And that's really what this um, data governance will also help you with is making sure that the right people are where they need to be and they have the right information to do what they need to do. All right, so that is my take on why you might wanna think about doing some vectoring on your document space, how you might wanna use link data or knowledge graph data to connect those zones, those vectors and those documents together for more efficient update processes. And again, there's a big security and safety piece to this where if you need to make sure you're compliant, you need to make sure that the data is getting updated in all the places that it needs to be, this is a really great way to do it. And with that, I thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.